Hi, you're watching Left Foot Media. My name is Brendan Malone, and in the wake of last week's terror attack, the mosque shootings that happened uh, here in New Zealand, uh, in my hometown of Christchurch, uh, I thought I would uh, talk about something that has become really abundantly clear to me. Uh, in the, in fact, it's prompted me to action um, in the day or so uh, after the shootings, and that is the fact that there is absolutely nothing to be gained by us being on social media and engaging with print media journalism, um, particularly the print media journalism websites, in the, the days uh, immediately after a, a terrorist attack like this one. Uh, now, when I say social media, I'm talking about here basically those social media sites. Basically, it's, it's, it's Facebook and Twitter. Social media sites that are nothing more than a repository or an information dump for people. They just, here's an article, here's a video, here's a theory I've got, here's something I've heard, and they just it's just a slew of, of, of uh, anyone just chucking any old thing out into the internet sphere. And, and also print media journalism, and particularly the print media websites. Those things can be helpful as an attack is happening. So when the initial news broke and the attack began to unfold, there's no doubt there is a beneficial communications aspect that you can get from social media. The ability to actually connect quickly with friends uh, and to find out if they're okay and to pass on information and to get information yourself. And then they can also have, I think, a limited value if you want to do something positive to contribute to aiding the victims of these events and doing something proactive to actually help after, you know, in the immediate aftermath of a terrorist attack. So basically you can go onto social media and you can, uh, you know, find out how to donate or, you know, what the particular needs are and how you can contribute to those needs. But outside of that, they're actually, they, they actually make terrorist attacks worse. That, that, that's what I've realized in the last day or so after the events that happened just last Friday here in Christchurch. Basically, we already know this, that social media, even at the best of times, is, uh, is largely an echo chamber. But in the aftermath of a terrorist attack like this one, uh, social media becomes a, a powder keg echo chamber. It's, it's, it's just, it's rife with things like paranoia, unfiltered emotions, uh, tribalism, unverified rumors, lots of misinformation flying around. And it, it just becomes basically an open pipeline of, of raw emotion and even hysteria. And this is the last thing that you need in your society in the wake of a, a, a race-based or religious terror attack or any sort of uh, ideologically motivated mass murder, uh, you know, act of terrorism like we, we, we've just seen uh, here in New Zealand. Uh, because one thing that's apparent to me is I can already see that you've got um, uh, dangerously fearful and angry mob type mentality things already starting to happen here in New Zealand on social media primarily and also in print media, that they are sowing the seeds for actual further division after this event. Like, think about print media, because print media in particular, what happens in the hours during an attack, so while something's going on, um, people come to those sites to get information, and they need those sites because they need to get information, and that's where they really do come in handy. And so people go there to get, inform get information. And we know now for print media journalism that, that their primary, one of their primary sources of revenue now is, is really driving clicks through the website. So they need to generate and they need to keep traffic coming. Now, in the initial attack, uh, people go to those sites because they need the information. They've got a reason to actually keep going there. And also, there is a lot more information. They're up, constantly updating things. So they've, they've got a lot of information they can put out. Even if it's not major updates, they, they keep... They're able to keep broadcasting information, and that keeps driving uh, traffic to the site. But then once the terrorist attack is, is all over and it comes to an end, at that point, there's not the same reason for people to keep going to those places to get information, and there's not lots of new information coming. And so that's when they have to start generating clicks, and they have to actually give people more and more reasons to keep uh, you know, to keep the traffic coming to their sites. And the, the way they do that primarily is by editorializing. It's op-ed columns, and, the, and they just start flying around. And you get these people who are no more informed uh, than you or I are, as a general rule, this is the norm, the vast majority of, of, of print commentary that you get. It's not coming from people who are any more informed than you or I. It's just people who are in pretty much the same situation as, as you, who've got the same information that we're all working with, and yet they are 
trying to carve out a niche for themselves in the opiate space, and they are just pontificating about what they think the causes are, who's to blame, what the fixes are, but they don't know anything more than you or I, and it's far too early. Like within less than 24 hours after the event, I already saw the opinion columns beginning to be circulated from people declaring that they knew what the cause was, saying that we warned about this, and all the basically just all sorts of conjecture and speculation that is really unhelpful and just actually is adding to a sense of chaos around the event. It's, it's not actually helping us. What you need in a situation like this is actually calm. Everyone needs to stop, take a deep breath, and really, effectively, we all need to sort of shut up and, and stand back. And actually, there needs to be a proper and thorough investigation to actually understand motivations, to understand uh, what contribu contributed to these events, understand how it all unfolded, and then, then we can begin to have a discussion once we, once we actually know more about what has gone on here and what has contributed to these events. But anything else is just pure conjecture. And, and, and to, to make matters worse, what happens, particularly on social media, is that and, and, or any, anything you do where you sort of jump on your phone and you're constantly scrolling for more opinion columns or you're constantly scrolling a social media feed is you're not actually connecting with people in any meaningful way that can actually help you. All you're doing is you are sitting alone uh, cycling through, so it's you in your little bubble of your own head effectively, cycling through uh, endless cycles of this largely superficial, highly uh, emotionally charged venting from people, whether it be venting from an op-ed columnist or whether it be venting from people on social media. And, and basically what that means is that social media becomes the perfect way to sort of ferment uh, chaos and, and effectively to bring people to their knees, to bring you to your knees, because you get stuck in a cycle of fear-mongering. You get stuck in a cycle of people who are just expressing their doubts and their concerns, and that's all you're seeing. You're scrolling through this, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. The other thing, of course, is that you, you get something online called online disinhibition effect, where people go a lot further and say things that they would never ever say if they were in a room with a person or they were face to face with them or even talking on a phone to them. Why? Because they can't hear a person's voice, they can't see a person's face. The normal empathy mechanisms in your brain don't function the same way on social media. And so what happens is you end up saying things and doing things that you would never ever say to people and certainly in a situation like this, there's a lot less pausing that goes on. One of the biggest rules I always advise people with social media is pause before you post anything. Take a deep breath, particularly in moments of controversy. Take a deep breath and ask yourself, should I be posting this? Go away, have a cup of coffee and come back. And often you realize, nah, this is not going to contribute to anything positive. But in situations like this, there's very little pausing going on. People are just posting, posting, posting. And so you're scrolling through this and what you are seeing is just an open pipeline, a constant slew of people either expressing uninformed opinions, raw emotion, conjecture, misinformation, rumors and gossip, uh, or their, their own doubts, and they, they just open up their own fears and they just throw them all, I'm so afraid, I'm so scared, and, and, and you're, you are just sitting there in the stew of fear and paranoia and misinformation, and, and, and you're not connecting with people, you're connecting with pixels, and it's really not helpful for you. It's not helpful for anyone. And this is important because if we remain in that state and, and we're constantly feeding ourselves this constant and, and a unrelenting diet of this sort of stuff, uh, you know, information coming at us 100 miles an hour that we're not even having time to process, coupled with people's fears and doubts and, and paranoia and misinformation and everything else, then, then things can actually end up a lot worse not just in society, but also for us as individuals. And it's something I realized sort of by Saturday afternoon, I realized to myself, hold on a minute, I'm getting stuck in the social media trap here over this issue. And, and this is actually doing things to me that are not good. I need, to, I, need to, um, I need to uncouple myself and get the heck away from this. Because basically, in, in a situation like this, we actually need reserves and stoicism to draw on. It's actually essential. If we're going to go forward and make our way through this, we can't simply be raw, open pipelines of raw emotion where we're just throwing everything out there. Now, yes, we, we shouldn't be closed and, and, and sort of heartless 
and unemotive, weird sort of, uh, I don't know, automatons or robots either. That's not good either. But you want to avoid both extremes. You want to avoid the extreme of being someone who is just cold and has shut off their emotions because that's not a good thing. But raw emotion is also a problem at the other end of the spectrum because both of those two extremes can lead to really bad outcomes, whether it's our actions, the way we think about others, the way we respond, uh, government legislation and policy. If it's driven by those two extremes, you get in real trouble. What we actually need in this situation is some reserves and a bit of stoicism to draw on. And, and the way you get those reserves and that stoicism is actually, I would say, to withdraw from social media and all the op-ed columns and everything else and to actually uh, to to engage in periods of, um, of contemplation, really, of these events of your own life and also, I think, active participation in the real world and real world events. So effectively getting on with life and doing things in the real world, in particular for other people, actually, you know, loving your 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 wife and kids, uh, you know, y- your boyfriend, your girlfriend, uh, giving yourself to the people around you who need you, getting on with those sort of things that might seem like mundane tasks and they might seem like the last thing you really feel like doing, but even something as simple as going out and spending an hour in the garden, like I did on the weekend, was just, it was such a liberating thing. It helped to give me a sense of, of uh you know, a peace and liberation from all of the horrors of what were going on. And it helped me to actually set my mind straight and to clear my head a bit. And what I found was then I go back into my, uh, the situation with my kids and my family and other people around me. And there's sort of something, there's a bit more of a reserve there. There's a little bit more depth to actually draw on there now. I'm not just sitting there with them repeating and pondering and drawing on a, a whole slew, an open pipeline of raw hysteria. I'm actually drawing from something that little little bit deeper, you know, still waters run deep. So here's a couple of practical tips that I think are really helpful for, for anyone, for all of us. Number one is start your day with 30 minutes of silence, reflective silence. Go for a walk, go in silence, or maybe stick a bit of classical music on if you want to or something like that, but, but actually I would encourage reflective silence. If you can't do 30 minutes, at least do 20 minutes. I'll tell you what I did this morning. I got on the treadmill, and I had my earbuds in, but I didn't have any music on. It was amazing how that just, it, it just helped. It really did help. Just that 30 minutes of, of reflective silence and contemplating things and contemplating the day ahead. Now, if you're a religious person, you're probably going to want to chuck a bit of prayer into that, to the mix of that. If you're not, that's fine. Still do the 20 or 30 minutes of reflective silence where you're pondering things. You're thinking a bit more deeply. You're actually just drawing out of all of the noise and the constant uh, just 120 miles an hour of information that's flying at you. And you've got no time to process. You're actually drawing back and you're starting to process the real world again. So do that. And the other thing I'd say is don't go onto social media uh, within two hours of your bedtime. So basically, if, you, if you're going to bed at 10 p.m., get off social media at 8 p.m. Let your mind at the end of the day wind down and actually stop and get away from all of this this nonsense. Now, I would say this is this is really good advice at the best of times, but in the midst of, of, of the aftermath of a major terrorist attack like this one, this, is, I would suggest, is really, really important because we need more people, not less, who have got their wits about them, who have actually got a, a certain amount of appropriate levels of stoicism and appropriate reserves of, of depth and not just superficiality and not just a constant slew of, of unverified information that's just uh, cycling around in their head at 120 miles an hour. We actually need people to actually t- to let those still waters run a bit deeper in their lives right now because otherwise... You know, this is actually just making the situation worse. The more time you spend on social media after a terrorist attack, the more the situation actually gets worse and and the greater the chance becomes for for division and problems to actually arise within our society if that's the thing that we're sort of, the the, the space that we're constantly and and spending uh, most of or even hours of our day engaged with. Get offline, spend time in the real world, get silent, get reflective, get with people and actually engage with them. If you do that, we are all going to be in a far better situation and we are all going to be far more equipped to actually deal with this and begin to move forward in an intelligent, a genuinely humane, a compassionate and, and loving and productive kind of way. But if we don't do that, we're going to get stuck in the superficiality and we're going to be in real strife. As per usual, I'd love to hear your thoughts, so please let me know what you think in the comments section below. And if you like the content I'm creating and you'd like to see more of it, then please consider financially supporting the channel. The links for how to do that are found in the video description below. I'll see you next time on Left Foot Media.